Thank you, uh, Irene, um, and good morning to you, everybody. I hope you had a good uh, night of sleep, some caffeine and maybe some blueberry jam and other botanicals this morning. Um, thank you. I indeed want to talk about the Belfried project, but first I want to talk about the regulatory approach uh, we have in Belgium. And I will start with this uh, slide. I think indeed we have to open up our mind to new uh, technologies, to new research, but we don't have to open up our mind till our brain falls out. I think um, we also have to remember that the tree doesn't grow from the top down. We have to make sure that we don't forget the base and the roots. So I think we first have to assure, and we talked about it yesterday too, first assure a correct identification of what we're talking about, the botanicals. And we also, I think, it would be good to use traditional knowledge to, as a guide, actually, as a guide for safe use of botanicals. And so I think we need a, a clear and a practical approach, uh, which could be immediately applicable under the current regulation. And I think we also need an approach which provides uh, traceability and uh, also provides appropriate consumer information and consumer protection. So that's why I want to, in this next 20 minutes, briefly talk about the Belgian legislation with four main ingredients, uh, so to say, the list of plants that we have, a notification procedure, the advisory commission that we have, and um, the advisory commission that also sets uh, maximum levels and mandatory warnings. And then in my second part, I will talk about the harmonization project, and I'll give you my conclusions. So just this first uh, slide to frame a bit our decree, uh, which was published already in 97, so you have to remember this is a long time before there was even a definition of food supplements in uh, the regulation, a time before we were talking about traditional herbal medicine uh, uh, directive. And uh, after this first publication, um, we had about nine decrees with adaptations, of course, the transposition of the food supplement directive, and afterwards, in 2005, we had uh, maximum uh, levels and warnings uh, integrated in this decree. When I started, uh, I had to start with a, a big amending of this decree, and we notified this uh, amendment to the European Commission. Afterwards, we had to provide some extra justification for the mandatory warnings we have for several uh, of the botanicals in, um, in the positive list. But after the positive advice of the Commission, we could publish uh, in 2012 a new uh, decree. Well, a new adaptation at least. So I consider this uh, an EU-wide confirmation of our approach. And um, actually now I'm working at a new adaptation, which is of course related to the harmonization project. Just to uh, let you uh, have a view on how this decree works, uh, what is the scope? So it applies to all um, uh, food and food supplements that contain plants. In the annex, uh, we have three lists, list one, with uh, plants that cannot be used in, in food. Although, uh, if you uh, want to have an exception on this uh, uh, prohibition, you can ask uh, with uh, sufficient information on uh, toxicological uh, information and other information, uh, we can have uh, derogation. List two uh, are the edible mushrooms, and list three is more important for today, the plants that can be used in food supplements under conditions. So list one and two applies to all food, and list three only to food supplements. Just uh, some examples uh, with some beautiful names, uh, devil's helmet, uh, angel trumpet, but they do contain uh, toxic compounds. Uh, but on the other hand, on list one, also uh, plants that uh, where we already specify the conditions for this derogation. For example, uh, borago could be used if it's proven that uh, it doesn't contain perlosdine alkaloids. So you see 390 genera and species on this list. List uh, two, the, the mushrooms, you can see here some very well uh, known names uh, which can also be used in food supplements. And list three, more important, you see here um, the, some yeah, well-known uh, botanicals that we can find uh, a lot of times in a lot of different food supplements. Uh, you see ginkgo, you see passiflora, uh, but also just more regular botanicals like green tea and 
ginger and uh, ginseng. So these uh, plants we can find a lot in uh, food supplements. 645 species. And in the bottom you can see a very interesting link I would uh, check is the plant list uh, since a few years. They um, have a combination of different databases uh, to find the correct uh, botanical name and this is getting more and more um, yeah, uh, verified and trustable so it's a very good website. So then a bit more about our notification system which is also in place since uh, 97 already. Of course in the beginning it was a paper version but I will show that it's now also digital. So we have an extensive notification procedure and uh, the team really verifies um, at the market introduction, they verify very thoroughly all the details of um, the ingredients and all um, the packaging, etc., of these products that are notified, uh, which are not only uh, food supplements, also fortified foods. So they check the conformity with the regulation, and if necessary, they will send uh, such a dossier for extra advice to a commission, which I will explain in a few slides. After a month, we sent a confirmation that we received the dossier, the confirmation of uh, the notification, and possibly we can give some remarks, um, propositions to change certain things uh, to be uh, conform with the regulation. Now, maybe this is not the main uh, issue or topic uh, for today, but uh, I want to show uh, why we have the cutting edge on uh, notification. We have a digital system since last year. Uh, this just schematic uh, overview, so we have a public uh, website where you can just see uh, the names of the food supplements that are um, notified in Belgium. A uh, second layer is the so-called uh, front office where the industry, the, the firms can introduce their dossiers uh, in this uh, database. And also on the other side, the controlling agency can have some details on the ingredients, etc. of these food supplements. And then uh, the last uh, level is uh, where we sit behind our computers, uh, the back office, so, so they call it, where we have uh, merged different um, uh, silos of information to um, yeah, facilitate this notification procedure. Of course, less paper, um, a better overview. And you can see, of course, the small letters you can't read, but uh, in three languages, because in Belgium we do have three languages. Uh, but also in English, so in uh, German, we're still working on the German version. But you can see this is, uh, makes for uh, Belgium everything much easier. We can filter through the dossiers, we can search in dossiers, and we get an overview of the workflow. And we also have detailed information on all the ingredients. So for botanicals, for example, you can see the name, the correct name of the, the botanical, which plant part is used, and also uh, the dose uh, in active ingredient and um, they can attach uh, extra information on uh, stability or certificate of analysis and so on. So you can see this is um, making our life a little bit easier. So here again, uh, this is what we ask, mainly the, the packaging, but for botanicals also very extensive uh, uh, details on the botanicals and um, information on the active ingredients and we ask the firms to uh, frequently analyze uh, their products. Nowadays also for uh, some dossiers we need to go even further in detail. We ask the production method, the percentage of solvents that are used, the drug extract ratio, so sometimes we do go quite far to make sure that we know what is on our market. Uh, maybe here to say that it is quite uh, labor intensive, but yeah, like I said, we get a very good view on the product on our market and we can uh, act on certain problems uh, much quicker that way. I talked about the commissions just a few slides ago. Uh, we have actually four different uh, commissions uh, on this. So our office has for nutrients and other substances uh, the Superior Health Council which evaluates uh, uh, toxicity or other issues on these ingredients. For botanicals, uh, I'm the secretary of the uh, uh, advisor Commission on Botanicals. And then you have on the other side the Medicine Agency for Herbal Medicine Products. They have a uh, Herbal Medicine Product uh, Commission in Belgium. And in those famous cases of doubt, when it's not sure if it's a medicine, 
then there's a mixed commission where also our office uh, will look at certain dossiers which could fall under the uh, medicine legislation. I can only uh, talk about our advisor commission because this is the one that I follow up. This is um, a picture of our chairman, which is a very renowned um, expert on botanicals, Professor Emeritus uh, Professor Vlieting. And um, yeah, this is amazing. If you give him a plant, you can really, uh, he will start telling you all the different substances and how they work and what the, the effect is. And uh, some of the experts in our commission also uh, participate uh, at the EMA um, Herbal uh, Commission. Uh, so they have a very good broad view on the use of botanicals. Of course, this commission um, will do the scientific uh, safety evaluation of the plant preparation, but also of the dossier itself. Uh, so if there's a need for extra information on stability or other analysis, they can very uh, well pinpoint what we need uh, to make sure that we have safe products on our market. So mainly they uh, go through uh, these dossiers, especially when the plants are not on our authorized uh, list of botanicals. Um, also when they want to use the plants that are actually uh, should be forbidden. It's possible that a certain preparation or a certain plant part of this botanical can still be safe. It's a bit the same approach as uh, the EFSA compendium, actually. If you have the right preparation, it can still be uh, okay. So sometimes they need to uh, determine maximum levels or uh, mandatory warnings. And also, especially I mentioned here, the dossiers with essential oils. We see sometimes, uh, already since 2005, actually, um, encapsulated essential oils and there were some uh, questions if uh, about the safety of these products. So for those products, um, I mentioned that here, we have a data sheet developed where we ask much more information still because yeah, there we definitely in a gray zone about uh, toxicity. So uh, for essential oils, we need more information on acute toxicity or uh, chronic uh, or long-term toxicity. And uh, we ask um, also that they are in line with the um, um, European pharmacopoeia, actually. So in this way, they also follow up literature, of course, and side effects. In this way, we have a provision, uh, um, pro progressive revision of the list. And uh, we try to publish this advice of this commission as soon as possible on our website. Now, I want to just briefly touch on two tools they have, and which I mentioned. Uh, we have maximum levels, but also mandatory warnings. If we think about maximum levels, you can have maximum levels for substances of concern or for active ingredients. So if it's about substance of concern, it's like I just mentioned also, the, like the EFSA compendium. You have to make sure, of course, that these substances are not anymore in the final preparation, in the final product. So you need also there a very uh, clear characterization of the botanical. You need uh, a collection of bibliographic uh, data and information on the traditional use of these botanicals. And uh, of course, uh, we ask the right analytical reports to make sure that in the final product, these substances are not, uh, are not present anymore. Then if you talk about active ingredients, of course, um, we do this to make a distinction between what can be food supplements or what should be uh, medicine. And uh, this has now also been confirmed uh, by the European Court uh, cases, which you probably have heard of. Uh, for example, the garlic case, where it's clear that uh, case by case um, approach is necess necessary. And also the red rice case, where, and I think this is uh, important, the dose is a key factor in this characterization. So only if necessary and if possible, then we try to determine uh, for those ambivalent plants, like they're called, uh, a maximum level. And this maximum level is a certain percentage of the minimal daily therapeutic dose. And these doses, of course, uh, obtained after evaluation of the clinical trials for a well-defined indication. And uh, here it's clear that uh, the information that is uh, presented in the EMA monograph or WHO monographs or other information on a traditional use uh, is very important to put all together and find a balanced way to set a maximum level. Then, 
if we look at mandatory warnings, are really also a tool, an important tool, I think, to have the right information for the consumer, to have uh, a certain um, proportional level uh, for consumer protection, but also information. Uh, we have certain warnings to actually yeah, inform uh, certain specific target uh, groups. And this is, for example, also um, already mentioned uh, a long time ago, I think it was 2008, in, um, in a document of the Council of Europe, where they um, explain about the specific uh, groups that could be, um, yeah, um, could be in, in, in danger is a big word, but could be... Um, uh, ha need more information on the use of these products. So also this is done on a case-by-case -case basis and uh, we look at uh, possible adverse effects and all the information that is available in the monographs or compendium and so on. So this is in principle of a precautional principle actually so we, we try to um, be careful with this but make sure that um, for those products where necessary we have mandatory warnings. Here you can see an example, an example that we saw yesterday too, the citrus uh, aurantium. Um, first of all, we only allow certain plant parts, uh, which normally also traditionally used, uh, in this case, the leaf, flower, and the fruit. We have, uh, like we've seen yesterday, set a maximum level for uh, paracinephrine, and we ask the absence of metacinephrine, because if I remember right, this should not be present in uh, this fruit. So it's clear if they can, uh, to make sure that it's no adulteration or et cetera, we have to set um, absence of metacinephrine or maximum level for paracinephrine. And also for products, uh, food supplements with uh, preparations of citrus orantium, we can see here the bonatory warnings that we have. And you remember from yesterday that, uh, for example, in combination with caffeine, we have to be careful and that's why uh, we have here also, you can see the, at the bottom, uh, if signs of anxiety and nervousness stop taking the product. I think this is a clear advice and I hope that uh, consumers that take such products uh, yeah, don't put their body in danger. They have to be careful with these kind of products. The maximum level of caffeine we have uh, set because of advice that we got from the Superior Health Council. As I've heard uh, uh, that EFSA is... Uh, uh, currently also evaluating new information on caffeine and we will be very uh, looking at with much interest at the uh, result of this evaluation and the decision of the Commission together with the uh, uh, member states. So that's uh, another um, yeah, safety uh, level that we set. Okay, so with all this in uh, the back of your mind, knowing that we did this already since yeah, 17 years now, um, I want to show you why logic uh, next step would be harmonization. You can see here an overview of all the legislation that is actually applicable also for food supplements. Of course, the food supplements uh, law uh, 2002-46, but also no food regulation, health claims, uh, fortification legislation. But we also know that uh, there's different approaches in the member states um, there's no uh, real harmonization for botanicals, that is clear, for different reasons. Uh, there's a variety of risk management, uh, like you see in Belgium, is a quite extensive notification uh, procedure. In other countries, it's just uh, notifying the label. Uh, some countries have label requirements or guidelines. Some countries have a different attitude because of the traditional use of those botanicals. They have more, um, say, a medical approach. Some other countries uh, don't look all in detail on the botanical. So we have some discrepancies we have to acknowledge. We don't always know if mutual recognition can be applied. Uh, there's some uncertainty of, uh, on the classification. And this is uh, the biggest reason why, uh, first this slide still indeed, uh, more about um, the regulation on mutual recognition, uh, which you have to know this is applicable also for food supplements. So a uh, member state actually has to accept uh, food supplements which are legally placed on the market in another member state, except when there's a danger for health. But when do you have a danger for health? It has to be significant. Uh, how do you define that? That's already more difficult. But according to me and according to other uh, experts, um, 
Yeah, the proof of lawfully marketed you can't always uh, easily get from member states. And uh, this, uh, yeah, um, mutual recognition don't always uh, govern those borderline issues on classification, for example. And according to me, you would get a digression uh, to a lower level of consumer information and protection because, for example, when there is in another member states uh, a product on the market without such a mandatory warnings, and uh, we do uh, ask to put those on the label, yeah, do we have to accept such a product? So that's a difficult question. And this is the reason why uh, several years ago, about three years ago now, we started discussing with uh, Italy and France on how to approach these kind of discrepancies and uh, we're trying to find a better way um, to actually harmonize this approach uh, for the evaluation of botanicals in food supplements. So basically it comes down to an accelerated uh, mutual recognition but on a scientific basis. We basically try to agree beforehand instead of going case by case for every botanical uh, going back and forth, we try to do it uh, more all at once. I mentioned here the authorities besides myself uh, from France and from Italy, but most important, we work together with uh, uh, an uh, expert, a renowned expert in each country, Robert Anton, uh, Professor Robert Anton, Professor Serafini, and also Professor uh, Del Mulle from Belgium. So what did we do? The first step in this uh, project was trying to uh, draft a, a list of the botanicals that were already allowed in these three countries. So our, our approach is not that inventive. We just uh, took the lists from the three countries, but we had to throw them all together and verify all the names, which was a big work, of course. Uh, luckily, like I mentioned, we had the plant list, which uh, uh, stated very clearly the synonyms that uh, are uh, used for certain accepted names and so on. So we had to go through about 2,000 species and find out the right name. So I think this is the first important step to know what you're talking about. Then the experts got to work uh, even more intensively and mentioned the synonyms that were already in the list but also the family, because that gives an indication on uh, certain substances that can be present in these uh, families. Then they mentioned the traditionally used uh, plant parts, uh, also based on the plant parts that were already mentioned in uh, this list, and then mentioned uh, certain plant parts or substances uh, that could be of concern or could be important, and sometimes, if necessary, further information. So sometimes uh, essential oil might be extra important for certain plants. Sometimes certain effects should be looked at. So they just identified uh, certain risk, basically. At the end, they gave uh, some kind of advice, for example, to uh, advise to analyze certain substances or to maybe consider uh, certain safety warnings. So you can see this is the same kind of approach as what we have been doing in Belgium and it's logic that we work together with France and Italy because they had a kind of same approach too. Here a brief overview, you can look at it later in, uh, in, my, uh, in the presentation when it's online. All the different data that these uh, experts uh, look at, of course they are used to this because they worked also in the EFSA working group, uh, for example, for the compendium. They have a very extensive uh, expertise in uh, botanicals and they looked up uh, as much information as possible, looked at the latel, latest uh, references and mentioned those also in our list. So the result was that we got uh, a list of about a thousand uh, plants. Um, you can see here uh, that about 400 plants were already present in four countries, uh, about 180 plants in two countries, and you can understand that we had to take out some plants uh, because of differences in, in traditional use. In Italy it's quite uh, different uh, already since long time how they use the botanicals. Sometimes you, we saw mentioning of certain uh, subspecies, certain varieties which could be left out if we left the more general species because it was quite similar sort of to um, simplify uh, our approach. So the plants that we set aside uh, in another list um, because we needed more information on the use of these plants 
or sometimes on the safety of these plants. So this is a list of about 150, probably in the future about 200 plants where we would need uh, more information and uh, yeah, if you think you could provide some information, uh, I'm happy to uh, share this uh, list with you because yeah, for these plants, uh, maybe they are used, but we don't have enough data and sometimes that's exactly the biggest problem, I think. Some plants are traditionally used, but actually to find data on it is not always that easy. It's very dispersed, uh, it's very fragmented, this information, not always uh, that easy to get. So, according to us, this precise identification, first of all, is the first important step uh, to have safe uh, botanicals in food supplements. And with this list, we try to indicate some key points, uh, not only in the regulation, but also in the production of uh, food supplements with botanicals. And uh, we try to take uh, traditional knowledge into account. It's a bit of pity, I don't have much time today to explain a bit more about tradition. But if we use this word traditional knowledge, it sounds, yeah, for some people maybe a bit vague, but uh, I will show you later in the next slide, uh, uh, the experts also wrote articles about this. So also a list is based on expert advice, and uh, like uh, I think it can be a pragmatic tool for risk managers and also for operators in the market to uh, assure uh, high quality and, and, and safety for botanical preparations. The problem with lists, and I think Mr. Botex knows this too, is uh, this is uh, a continuous uh, evaluation that has to be done. It's a living list, so if we would have a list of other member states, we could try to see where the differences are. Is there other uh, botanicals that we didn't consider yet? Is there inf information available? And so you can continue this work, uh, which is also labor intensive. And, uh, for example, a few weeks ago I went to Germany to explain about our approach and as you know that uh, Germany also has the Stoffeliste and there was the proposition to uh, start uh, with a negative list, basically, like our list uh, one. I think it's a good idea, but <laughs> let's uh, start with first things first and uh, this could also be considered. So here, like I mentioned, uh, the experts actually wrote very good articles on this traditional knowledge. Uh, traditional knowledge for the health effects, but also traditional knowledge uh, for the safety assessment of the botanicals. And also, um, the whole team wrote uh, an article in the European Food and Feed Law Review, which you should all read, um, to explain very extensively our uh, project. So you can look at this again uh, when you go back home. So according to us, the way forward, uh, maybe first, uh, like I've been explaining, um, we have done the consultations between the different member states. We drafted and finalized the list. We had several meetings, uh, first with the commission and later also with the member states and uh, stakeholders to explain our approach and uh, see uh, other propositions or other uh, remarks and now the 2014 and a bit of next year probably too, we will be integrating this list uh, bit by bit into our legislation. Uh, we're currently still revising the list. Uh, yeah, for me in Belgium, it's like I explained, together with the Advisor Commission on Botanicals, I have to uh, look with these experts to the list and I foresee that this uh, thousand plants will become a little bit less maybe but we will have a core list of um, botanicals where our three uh, countries could probably agree on and so we will integrate this in our legislation. Hopefully we can also in the coming uh, time also have um, yeah, a better uh, improvement of exchange of uh, advice, of uh, information with other member states. I think this is also an important part of uh, our project and also what we're doing here today is to get uh, the experts in the field uh, to know each other better, to have a better exchange between experts uh, that do analytical uh, work or other uh, risk evaluation, together with uh, authorities in a way that we could uh, come to a better structural approach to deal with botanicals. And maybe if uh, possible, we could also evaluate 
other list um, of uh, botanicals in other member states. So to conclude, I think I can say that the Belgian system already in place 17 years now is a proof of concept with the notification procedure that we have, the list and the advisor commission. Uh, this is yeah, shown that uh, this uh, can provide uh, or assure safe products on our market. We do see that there's uh, some uh, issues with uh, current legislation which is maybe not precisely adapted for this complex uh, ingredients. But we do uh, think that harmonization is definitely possible and necessary to have a more coherent uh, policies on botanicals, to have a pragmatic approach and to make sure that we have appropriate and, and proportionate measures. And, uh, while taking also the information on traditional use into account. And last but not least, uh, this way I think we can assure uh, safe, uh, uh, safe products on the market and enough information on the products to uh, inform the consumer and also provide legal uh, security for small and medium companies. I think we shouldn't uh, lose sight of that neither. So this is it for me and I thank you for your attention.